What's going on, podcast listeners? My name is Michael Chernow. I am a restaurateur and lifestyle entrepreneur, and I am truly obsessed with living a life better than yesterday through wellness, fitness, and good vibes. I've always wondered if the drive to succeed is something we are born with or if it's something that is made over time through grit, drive, and perseverance. I get to answer that question exactly and the goal of this podcast is to talk with people that have absolutely crushed it in life and have inspired me to do the same. This is Born or Made. I'm going to start recording here. Check, 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 check. Sweet. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Born or Made podcast. I have a guest on the show today who is on a team with me, which is pretty fucking dope. Uh, Tony Nash is a combat vet. He is a podcast host of a podcast called Got Your Six. And he just finished up a feat of strength for uh, 10,000 which is an incredible men's fitness apparel brand that the two of us are athletes for. He also happens to be an insane athlete. Um, but his feat of strength, is, uh, he did something called the Garage Gym Ultra. I'm going to let him tell us exactly what that is. It sounds fucking nuts. Um, but Tony is a beast, and he's probably one of the most positive guys uh, I associate with, specifically online, because we have not met yet in person. Um, we just we just connected over the pandemic. But Tony, welcome to the Born and Made podcast. It is such an honor to be here as a as a huge fan, right? First time uh, caller, long time listener. I uh, I appreciate you, dude. So I, I want to talk about a few things. Obviously, I'll tell you really quickly what the Born and Made podcast is and what we do here. Born and Made is a podcast that I launched a little over a year ago. Uh, we're sixty something episodes in. I get an opportunity to talk to guys like you that inspire me and many others. Uh, and I ask the question, do you think you were born with an inherent ability or an innate ability to get to where you're at today or were you made over time? Uh, and we don't, we don't answer that question till the end, but I really, I really love the nature nurture thing. I really, I'm, I'm so, I, I'm, I'm a hunter. Uh, discovery is a big part of my life. I am constantly curious. And so I love, I love to ask people that I feel like have similar uh, mentalities what they think about the nature nurture question. And that is what right. the premise of this podcast is. And the way we get there is through hearing your story. So let's kick it off. And why don't you give us your story from as early as you can remember uh, so that we can get to know you a little bit better. Yeah. Uh, thank you for giving me you know, the time to at least share my story. Um, I, we can go back as far as you want. You know, you always have those memories when you're a kid. Uh, and it's always something around like eating bugs. Um, so I think that's where we, we could start there, but we'll, we'll dial it back a little bit to high school. Cause that's really, I really think where to answer your question, we, we can see like a clear answer, whether it was, I was born or made and hashtag no spoilers. Uh, we'll say that to the end. <laughs> um, but I, in high school, uh, my sophomore year, I oh, unfortunately, shit, had, dude, you got to fuck my fucking thing. Did not, was not recording. Let me start that over. I'm so sorry, man. Yeah. That sucked because that was so fucking good. All yeah. right, here we go. Sorry about that. I'm such a fucking- I'm good, man. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Born or Made podcast. I have a guest on the show today who is a team member of mine. So this is, this will be a first. We're both on, uh, we're both athletes for Team 10,000, the 10,000 Captains, which is a men's fitness apparel brand that we both know and love. Uh, Tony Nash is a combat vet. He is a podcast host of a great podcast that's called Got Your Six. Um, he's an insane athlete. And, um, and he just finished up something called Feet of Strength, which is uh, a series that 10,000 puts on where they ask their athletes to do something extraordinary. Uh, Tony did a, uh, an intense, intense program called the Garage Gym what is it called, Tony? Garage Gym? The Garage Gym Ultra. The G Garage Gym Ultra. And, yeah. uh, and I'm going to let him tell us what that is. But before we get, before we get there, uh, the podcast Born or Made was brought to life because I really enjoy the nature nurture question. I am so curious to know whether or not athletes, performers, entrepreneurs um, were born with an ability to do what they do and get to where they're at 
or if they were made over time. Is it nature? Or is it nurture? Were you born or were you made? The way I like to get there is we go all the way back and get your story from as early as you can remember. Um, and so that way we can get to know you a little bit better and we can actually see what it was like growing up as Tony Nash. So welcome to the show, my man. Thank you for fucking joining. Thank you. Brother, thank you so much for having me. I've listened to almost all 60 episodes. I still have to go back and catch a few more from the, the inception. Uh, so I've watched it and re rewind. Um, but yeah, uh, to answer your question, we could go back all the way to, you know, when you're a little toddler running around eating sand, playing in the dirt. But I don't think that really answers your question. Um, so without boring everybody, we'll kind of fast forward a little bit to high school. Uh, I unfortunately, during my sophomore year, and it's one of those things you kind of look back in retrospect and you see this point in your life, you come to a fork and you're like, I could have gone two ways and one would be where I am today and the other way could have led to a very bad and negative, like we would have not be chatting, chatting today. But in my soft, right going into my sophomore year, um, my father committed suicide, which was extremely heartbreaking for the whole family. And it's something we continue to bear through this day, but it, that's kind of where the story picks up. So it's almost like a Disney movie, right? A parent dies and then the story begins. Um, this I'll do my best to keep it PG, but it might get unfiltered. So it's not probably not so much a Disney movie. Um, so from there, I kind of went down a path that was a, the, not the best, right? Getting in fights in school and things like that. Came to a point where I was like, I can either continue to go down this path. I you know, probably end up doing things that aren't good. Uh, they might be entrepreneurial but they, they're not looked at in the best light in the law and all of that. So I, I said, I think I need a fresh start. I transitioned high schools to where I was playing football, which ended up being probably the, the best career move I've made in my life. Um, my football coach at the time was a West Point graduate. He said, hey, have you ever thought of West Point? I was like, I have no idea what it is. And you know, I, the more I found out about it, and you've been there where you found things and you're like, I don't know what this is, but it feels right. And the more I get into it, the more right it feels. Mm -hmm. um, so then I fortunately was accepted into the West, uh, West Point, the United States Military Academy. Uh, I did four years there and I've been in the army ever since. Amazing, dude. And so yeah. you transitioned over to West Point and you played football there? No, so this was, uh, I went to West Point um, and I, my football coach actually called the football coach my high school football coach called the West Point coach and said, do not let him play. He needs to focus on his studies. And that was probably another, another thing where it's just kind of having the right people at the right time. Uh, Cause it, it, that's where I needed to be at the time. Cause I don't think academically I was, I was the big fish in my little pond, but when you go to be a big fish or a small fish, with a bunch of other big fish, you see how small you actually are. So it forced me to really like step up my game. What was it about, like, so So you get to West Point, what, what was it about yeah. West Point that you think gave you this catapult or springboard to the career you have today? Like, well, I know, I know it's military, but like, was there yeah. something there when you got there that clicked for you? I think it was before I got there, it was like, you know, the prestige, the honor, um, serving my country. I don't come from a military background. Um, but it's always kind of been in the family, you know, being proud to be an American. But getting there, it was really focusing on my fitness. Um, there was a small group of us early 2006, 2007, that got into this thing called CrossFit. Um, and every morning, 5.30, when the gym would open up, we would go work out before school. So we'd go work out for an hour. And it was not just me and my like classmates, but also Army officers, majors, lieutenant colonels, captains. Um, so you, I got to see this really cool level of mentorship that I never had where I'm sucking, you know, with somebody who has years of experience, could have been in a year before in Baghdad, um, you know, getting dodging bullets and things like that. And it was just, and you know, like you get to, you get to a place where you're both had that, that shared suck and you develop like this bond um, mentorship where you're just kind of learning off one another and the playing field is equal. So I think that was really it where I had that core group where we kind of just focused every morning. We got up and we knew we were going to be better than yesterday. Wow. Um, being able to take on discipline at that age, I think is unique. Um, discipline 
for me, I would argue to say is the cornerstone of my success in life in every, in all aspects of my life. Right. Some of us I've learned through the journey are able to take on discipline and withstand discipline and actually fall in love with discipline and structure and many, many others more so than the ones that love discipline, uh, absolutely hate it, you know? And, um, yeah. What do you, I would imagine discipline is a big part of your life. Yeah. Uh, I, go ahead. No, no, no. I, I, I want to, I want to get into discipline because I think it's, I think it's, uh, it's something that we don't talk enough about. And when people hear discipline, they think they, well, a lot of people think military, um, and yeah. they think, uh, negative. <laughs> right. I I've taken discipline to mean personal accountability, right? Whether I'm leading soldiers or myself. I can't, I can't ask somebody to do something else without showing up for myself first, right? Whatever that comes in. You're a huge proponent of this. And I see you live this life all day long. You're addicted to the pursuit of your goals. It's not so much the goal because you'll achieve it eventually. Um, and that's great. And goal, I, I definitely, as you do, relish in the accomplishments once they come to fruition. But it's really that pursuit of the process that I would, I, I hunger for every day. Why? Um, because I know I have more to give. I, I'm pushing the wall every day a little bit farther because everybody says, oh, I'm gonna give 100%. And I, I love that, but if you give 100%, means you're dead. You, you've maxed out your body, you have nothing left to give, your time is up, your clock is over. But you can push that wall a little bit farther every day. Um, and if I can push the wall continuously further, that process and those goals are gonna change, right? You've set off on paths where you wanted one thing and along the way you saw something that was 10X bigger or better, that was better for you, your family, your friends, your business, all of that. Um, because you can't, all you're seeing is that wall. And then the further you push that forward, the more you have in your periphery, right? You're able to see a, a better vision and you see where you've, how far you've come only when you look back, right? There's been times where I know you're like this too. Like, you're like oh man, I am just not, I'm not getting it. I'm sucking. Like, and then you just take a quick second to like, look behind you and you're like, holy shit, how far have I come in the mountains I've accomplished? There's many more to come, but I've done that. I can do hard shit. I'm going to continue to do it. You know, I, I question myself on a regular basis. <laughs> what, what is it that drives me to, um, to want to do hard things, right? Yeah. Like it, it, it is ultimately, I think, um, extraordinary people are known for doing and succeeding at doing hard things, uh, really, really hard things. Yeah. I, I do believe that there is a commonality amongst that um, genre of human being, right? There's, I can't tell you why I push hard. I probably, you probably can't really put a finger on why you actually have the ability to get up and go the way you do. Cause I see you and you're an animal. Um, you. you know, patience is another component here, right? Cause success in, and happiness doesn't happen consistently uh, overnight. What do you, what do you think patience um, plays? What role do you think patience plays uh, in your life? It's extremely important. Uh, one of the things we talk about, or like I talk about, we've talked about in deployments, you know, in units I've been in with my wife, who's also, if you think I'm a badass, she's a badass. She's one of the first female artillery officers in the history of the United States Army. Like she is just like, you're talking tip of the spirit trailblazer. But again, that's who I interact with on a daily basis. Like all the, like you said, elite performers. And we talk about this thing called tactical patience, right? It's being able to be in the arena, understand what's going on, taking a pause just to look out, see what's, and then start moving, right? Because if you just charge into battle or charge into whatever you're looking to do, you might end up in the meat grinder. And that, that doesn't end up well, right? Um, and sometimes that's okay, right? You, you learn a lot of lessons and you come back. Sometimes lives, when lives are on the line, you, you kind of, you're a little bit, you gotta, you gotta think like, all right, what risk am I willing to endure? And what am I not okay with? 
Um, so patience does play a huge part of that. And especially like we said, the tactical patience. So being able to be in the moment, kind of pull back for a second, look around, reflect, and then continue to press forward. And without that, um, you, I can't really, and it's just like whether you're journaling or reflecting, that's, I would consider that tactical patience, right? You're, you're reflecting on what's going on, what you're trying to do, and you're kind of recalibrating what the mission is that you're on. Um, I love that tactical patience. I think that is, um, if you can, if you can walk through life with tactical patience, you know, I talk a lot about the difference between reacting and responding. Um, and, you know, reacting is something that you do, and you would probably know this better than anyone. Um, you know, if you're getting shot at, or somebody's charging you, uh, you kind of react to that, right? Like, you're like, oh, shit, I'm gonna run, you know, or I'm right. gonna fucking fight back, or I'm gonna make a decision on the fly. And just the what like, I'm just gonna try to make the, the fastest, best decision I can make. Responding um, is what you know, civilians typically have to, you know, are, 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 um, have the ability to do more so than they think. Um, but the difference for me between reacting and responding is just that, that, that little moment of space you give yourself between an action that somebody else does or the world throws at you and the way you receive it, because responding, as far as I'm concerned, is, is actually a process of receiving something analyzing in a short period of time, long period of time, and then giving, and then acting back towards it. Right. right. Um, and when I was younger, I lived a reactionary life. I, I just, I, I, I didn't want to feel good. I mean, I didn't want to feel bad. I drank, I felt really good. I wanted to feel better. Um, mm -hmm. And, and, and I wanted that, that like sort of instant gratification. And so, you know, I think patience and discipline have been two of the most uh, influential practices that I've had in my life. Um, and I can only imagine specifically being in combat and military, you know, Jocko Willink is a, is a, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Jocko Willink. I mean, I have discipline equals freedom tattooed on my hand. That's how much it means to me. Um, how do you, how do you apply those things in, in regular life? I mean, it could be a tough conversation, right? Whether with a coworker, a family member, like you said, right? Are you responding or reacting? Where you're responding, it's you're taking that pause, hearing what was actually said, seeing how it's played out in time, and then giving a deliver that deliberate response. Reacting is just hearing what it is and just automatically throwing something back out there on hot, like what was that hot potato, right? You're just trying to pass it back and forth, um, and that's what it comes down to. And I'd say sometimes even those tough conversations, right? Having those. And being able to say what you mean and dive deeper in a relationship or, you know, whether that's with a partner or a friend or whatever, um, that's a huge thing that, that happens all the time, right? You, it could be you're in the store and somebody's really upset, like the cashier is like all flustered and you're just like, hey, and I've done this, like you just say, hey, I know you, you're having a shitty day. That person behind you wasn't the nicest. Let's just pause. We're here. We can relax. I'm not going to attack you. Let's kind of like deescalate. And then I'll ask my question, right? And I found that always to be helpful. Um, one, because it just shows humility, right? Like life can suck and it can suck really hard, um, but it doesn't need to be, right? And just taking that time to understand what's going on, interpret the situation and then respond, just like you said, it is kind of the way to go. And there's definitely time for react, like where you just, you just go, right? Things come off and you got to just, you got to go but it doesn't always be. So it's like that balance, right? And the, the beauty I love about balance is that it's imperfect because sometimes you're going to be really good at it and other times you're going to be really bad at it. And like, you're always trying to calibrate for that middle and it's like, you know, chasing that like red heron that doesn't exist. Um, man, you know, I, 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 military is something that I wish I would have done. It's, 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 it's honestly, I mean, I like you, I mean, I, I love my country. And um, I'm, I'm proud of my country uh, in its ups and in its downs. Um, and I do come from a military background um, and, I, and I didn't take the opportunity to, to join the military. Um, 
uh, were there moments throughout your career in the military that stood out in it, it, as life-changing moments? Were there moments where you really sort of like marked a moment in history for yourself and said, this is, this is going to change my life or this has changed my life? Yeah. From the time I entered West Point, it's called reception day, right? I had just graduated. People usually have like a month off, a couple of weeks. I graduated Friday. I started West Point on Sunday. Um, and you just kind of go right in, right into the fire. Uh, you got to, you know, you go from being a civilian, you have 90 seconds to say goodbye to your, you know, your loved ones. And then you go right into just, you know, now you have to process in, you know, six weeks, how to be part of the military, right? Even, even at West Point as a cadet. Um, but I remember just getting beat up and like, cause I could walk straight. It was this whole thing, but I remember showing up and on each bunk, right, was your stuff all laid out. So you had all your uniforms that you're going to get and you're going to wear. And I'm sorry if I get emotional. Um, I saw my name tape, right? Just a simple name tape. All it said is Nash, right? ACU at the time. Now it's OCP, which is like that darker camo. Um, and there was like a, you know, I started to get really emotional. I had, to, I had to check myself real quick. Not because I didn't appreciate the moment. I did. It still lives with me to, to this day. But it was just fascinating to see like my name, Nash. That was it. That's who I am, Nash. And then right next to it is U.S. Army. And it's like, this is going to be my life going forward for the foreseen future. And I couldn't be more excited. And I don't know how I got here. I mean, I do. I just kept moving along and grinding. But it's one of those things like, those are the moments I appreciate where you just kind of take a step back and you're like, holy shit. Um, another one was in Ranger School, right? So you're in Ranger School. You essentially just live with a rucksack on your back that can weigh up to 120 pounds. I went during the winter, uh, so it's just cold and wet, which is great. Um, being from, mm -hmm. you know, I'm just a kid from Buffalo, so I love cold weather. Um, but I remember being in the Florida phase, which is the final phase uh, of Ranger School, and we were patrolling. I took my hand off. I was carrying one of the machine guns at the time, and I started pinching my uh, my bicep, like right here. And you're like, why are you pinching your bicep? Are you like, are you hallucinating? I was like, no, because at Ranger School, you, you don't eat or sleep for essentially the entire time you're there. But it was more to just be like, I worked for four years to get to this point. I'm here. I'm in the moment. I want to remember this. Right. So I kind of just pinch myself just to remind myself, hey, any, I can always go back and pinch myself again and kind of almost pull myself back in that moment. It's like when you smell like apple pie. And it reminds you of like home or like there's different, you come from an Italian family, you know how it is. You smell different foods and things like that. And you just automatically get pulled back in to like grandma's kitchen or mom, you know, the big family dinners. Um, so there's multiple points along my timeline where I can kind of be pulled back. And I've always just kind of used the pinch thing uh, when I really just want to remember the moment. Uh, I don't know where that came from, why it came about. Um, but those are those moments like you talked about where I can just automatically go back and be like, this is going to change my life for forever. Um, so yeah, there's been multiple ones, but those are the two that kind of really stick out in my head. And then also, obviously, when I got married to my wife. <laughs> you don't want to forget that one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. She, she might take your head off. You're right. Um, <laughs> um, I love that. Uh, I love that pinching your arm to, to mark a moment. Um, yeah. I, I think we spend far too much time in the past and in the future and not enough time in the moment in the present. Um, you know, uh, and so that's a really great reminder. I, I'm going to actually pick that one up. Um, you said lead, lead a team and leadership is such a, uh, a distinct thing, right? I don't think everybody has the ability to, to lead. And I don't think that that's wrong. I just think that not everybody has the the uh, the skill set, the inherent skill set to lead. I think it is an, an inherent thing. Uh, was there was there a, a, a is, could you share a story with us that would potentially um, when you felt like you had actually you actually led, you were a leader and you knew it, and there was you know you there was something that you did in that moment that sort of cemented this idea that I am a leader and I'm going to be this person. Yeah, and I'll push back a little bit um, initially on what you said because 
being a leader takes fucking work. Sorry, excuse the language, kid show. I know. Um, but it does because the more I'm in charge of people or I have people in charge of me, the more it causes me to like go into reflection um, and like journal, take notes along the way, because like we've talked about throughout this conversation, right? You, you got to reflect on both the good and the bad. Um, so I don't think anybody, I agree, not everybody can lead, but not everybody wants to lead, right? Mm -hmm. It's just like, not everybody wants to run billion, like, you know, Microsoft or Apple or, you know, other people are, you, they just want to run a small, they want to run a, a restaurant, right? Um, and that's fine, right? But as long as you're doing what fills you with some sort of like just cause and you're pursuing something that means something to you, I'm all about it, right? Like we talk, I talk about serving leadership and like the janitor sometimes at buildings and there's tons of, you know, business courses that have done case studies on this, like the servant leader in the story isn't the CEO, it's not the CFO, it's not the project manager, it's the janitor. The janitor who knows everybody's name, who as they come in, they're like, hey, or the person who knows how you like, you like their coffee every day. And they give you a warm smile. It, it, again, it takes you back in that moment, that, that peace, that sense of humility, um, that we're kind of all in this together. Um, but leading, uh, there's, there's a couple examples. Uh, I will go back to a recent, so a couple of years ago, I was a battery commander, essentially a company commander. My background is field artillery, so battery is a company. Um, and I was in charge of about 90 people, $45 million of equipment was signed in my name. Um, and we had to take, we went from, we were stationed, I was stationed in Hawaii at the time. They flew us to Louisiana and we had to act as the enemy forces op for, um, to help train the other battalion or the other, yeah, the other battalion from Hawaii that was in the training. So we were on, we were the, we were the red, they were the blue, right? Red being the bad guys, blue being the good guys. Um, and having to have people all over the place trusting like hey here's the intent here's what we're trying to do today to my junior leaders and they would go and act and then i would const i would monitor and then pull feedback right because that's that's the hardest thing um and i'm sure you've been in spots too and people listening where you want feedback and you're like hey how am i doing you want some sort of evaluation you're like oh great work keep doing what you're doing like that doesn't help me right it doesn't help me to say hey keep doing i, I want to get better if I'm not comfortable where I'm at. I want more. How can I get there? Here's what I see. Um, and you got to kind of push back a little bit because people just want to be like, oh, hey, good. And that goes back to the, the tough conversations, right? But I say all that, going back into it, it's that sense of trust, right? And trust builds communication. Communication builds trust. So the more I trusted my superiors, the more we communicated. Um, and that's an unbreakable bond because once it does start to break and shift away, you start to run into a lot of problems. Was everything perfect? Absolutely not. Um, but I'm still very proud, not of what I did, but of the soldiers and what they were able to do uh, with the task they were given because it kind of sucks having to go out to a training area that we were just in a couple months ago and they gave it their all, right? So it's, it's enjoying and watching other people succeed and figuring out how you can help facilitate that group or unit to be better. No, it's so interesting that you say that because it's so similar to business, right? Um, I've led a number, you know, a number of businesses over the years. And as I got better, I really it was my trust level got stronger, right? I was able to trust the people I brought in and surrounded myself with so that I could free myself up to focus on growth, um, personal and business. It's, it, it, you know, it, it's a double-edged sword, of course, right? Like you give, you delegate and you give people responsibility and that allows you to lead because you are ultimately able to accomplish so much more when there's more hands helping. Um, it's like, if you had to move your apartment by yourself, it would suck. But if you brought in five people to help you, you'd kill it. Now, are they going to steal your watch when they're going through your, you know, your, your closet? That's something that you have to get comfortable with. 
you know, and it's, a, right. it's the same thing in business. And, and it sounds like that's a, that's a, a situation that you went through where you, you really just let go and you gave the teams the ability to go out and do their job and they did it. And, you know, it's, I, I know a lot of guys and gals uh, that are in leadership positions that really struggle with giving the reins away. Um, I might be uh, an extreme example because I really let people go. Like I really, I'm happy to like find somebody that I think is fucking awesome yeah. and say, here's the deal. You're actually better than me than this. hundred percent. You're better in, than me in this arena. I want you to take complete ownership and keep me posted. And if you drop the ball, I'm going to go there. I'm going to pick it up and I'll put it back in your hands. And if you, and I'm going to say, Hey, you dropped the ball. If you drop the ball again, I'm going to go, I'm going to pick it up. I'm going to put it back in your hands. And I said, Hey, this is the second time you dropped the ball. Let's fucking let's hold the ball. And if you drop it a third time, I don't say you're fucking done. I say, Hey, do you want to do this? Is this something you actually want to do? Because you keep dropping the ball, you know, and it doesn't look like you want to hold on to it. And that is my way as a leader of saying, I don't think this is working. And it's not passive aggressive. It's real, right? Because my ultimate goal, I brought this person in to the team because I thought they were awesome. And once I think somebody's awesome, most of the time, I tend to believe in them, even if they fuck up because we all fuck up. So my intention by saying, hey, do you actually want to do this is for them to say, yes, I actually want to do this. I need help. I need help. And that's when I start taking some of the rain back. And that's the dance, right? That's that balance dance. Um, and, um, and I think that is such, it, it is, it, it, it's a much more freeing experience as being a leader when you can actually trust the people that you have on your squad, as opposed to being the one that has to answer all the questions, knows all the answers, and uh, everybody ultimately ends up hating. You know, like there's, there's if, if you bring people on your team or, 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 or if you're playing a sport and you never pass the fucking ball, you know, People, people tend to say, hey, that dude never passes the ball. That guy sucks. Right. Um, let's talk about feats of strength for a bit. Uh, yeah. Walk us through your feats, your feet of strength. So um, 10,000 and I, like you, we, we all constantly remain in touch. And like, that's been the coolest part of this journey so far with the 10,000 team. It's just, I could call you, you could call me and be like, hey, I need some help. I, you, and you're allowed to be vulnerable around like these high performing you know, male athletes, because we're an all male team right now, because that's 10,000 is male brand. Um, and you can drop that ego in, in a world where ego, you know, is king, as people like to say. Um, so, but everybody can be vulnerable at times and say, hey, I need some help. Um, so we're talking 10,000. They're like, hey, we're going to feed the strength. We want to do something a little bit different than this Ergathlon. So Ergathlon was created by Concept2, the rowing company back in 2019, where it's a 10,000 meter um, ski erg, 20,000 meter bike erg, and then a 10,000 meter row. And they're like, we like this, but we want to make it something bigger. What do you got? I was like, can you set, let's, we'll talk about this. So we went back and forth. Ultimately, we, we resulted with half marathon on the ski erg, full marathon on the bike, half marathon on the rower. Um, and because I just love to get uncomfortable, uh, <laughs> a half marathon on the assault runner, the self-powered treadmill. Oh, and they're like, we yeah. love it. I said, cool. When do I do it? They're like, you got a month. I said, even better. Good. Right. As your hand. Good. Um, so I just started training. Right. I was in the middle of grad school at the time at Cornell studying regional planning and real estate development. And I just figured it out. Right. I, I reached out to people that I knew had, I have never considered myself an endurance athlete until now. Right. I, I run for the army every six months for a physical fitness test. Um, but I, I just can't, I, I was never like, Oh, I can't wait to go run 15 miles or any of that stuff. It was just never, it wasn't in my blood. Um, why? Because I didn't, I didn't like being that uncomfortable. Um, so during this process, right. During my month train up, I found a lot out more about me than I thought I, I was expecting to. Um, so I would work out and do my normal workouts in the morning, wake up at five, you know, do some meditation. And just going to the gym because I, I was fortunate enough 
being a place during COVID where we had a, or we've converted our whole garage gym or garage into a gym. Um, so I could just kind of go there and playing and bang. Um, so I would do that. And then in the evenings before my wife would get home in between like classes and stuff, because I wasn't going in person, it was all virtual, which also helped this whole situation in terms of doing the feet of strength. I would get another workout, in, right? Another hour, 90 minute, two hour workout. And then on the weekends, we'd go anywhere from three to like six hours um, at the end, you know, doing those 15 K of each. Uh, and it really forced me to be like, I always said I was an endurance athlete. Why not? Right. And I've always, I've tell you, like, I use my name um, backwards, right. Cause I'm, I have dyslexia. Uh, why not? Right. Tony backwards is why not, you know, I need to spell it out. Um, and the reason was, I had intrepidations on getting uncomfortable. So I said, okay, let's get uncomfortable and let's find out where we really are. Who, what are we about? Who are we really? And so that, you know, that's what led to this whole motivation and intent purpose process that drove the Garage Gym Ultra. Dude, I, I you know, when I hear you say that, all I can think about is we can do anything we want to do. Anybody who's listening to this podcast, just know that there is nothing that you cannot do if you just do it. It yep. sounds simple. It's not easy. But I believe that at my core, right? I mean, when I was 23, I was, an, I was a full-fledged alcoholic and drug addict. I never thought in a million years that I would have run marathons and competed in kickboxing and... I'm a fucking pro bodybuilder, like running businesses, a father, you know, like all those things. I never even, I never thought that there was any chance. It never even crossed my mind. And once I started on this journey of wellness and better living and, 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 and literally living the lifestyle of better than yesterday, I realized that I can do anything I want to do. Anything. And if I said to you right now, Tony, you know, I've been thinking about being an astronaut. I, I, I kind of I feel like it would be amazing to go into space and, and, and be an astronaut for the United States of America. Yeah. If I dedicated the next 15 years to 20 years of my life, chances are in 20 years, there's a there's a shot that I could be up and fucking no, you know like knowing obvious, you you would be a knowing <laughs> you you'd be a fucking astronaut. I, I but I but, but here's the thing that I I would say and I and I think that this is interesting especially for people listening. We are the roadblock. We are yeah. the hurdle. We are the wall. Yep. And I've learned that over and over and over again throughout my life in this journey. I am typically my biggest problem. And once I release that and honestly just be and do, I've got the world in the palm of my hands, man. And, and it's not, and I'm not unique. There's nothing unique about me, which is the, this is the most awesome part of it, right? Like we can all, just put our fucking head down and do it. You know, I think Nike just, they absolutely, I know that we're on team 10,000, but I can't, I have to say that like that tagline, just do it. Best tagline ever outside of better than yesterday. <laughs> but you know, yep, it's, absolutely, it's, yeah. it's it, like, you know, want plus do equals have done. That's okay. it. it. It is, there is, you know, and so when you say to me, you know, oh, you know, I, it just wasn't in me that the endurance athlete thing, but you just fucking did it. Right. And you are. Yeah, yes. And you're oh, yeah. fucking damn good. Thank you. So it's yeah. like, I, I, you know, for, I, I would love to hear from you. Um, you know, if, if there's someone listening here, who's just, who's struggling and wants to change and, you know, is looking to fitness as as an outlet or, or or a pathway channel avenue to change their lives because i could honestly say for me fitness is everything period done 
solves all my problems. What kind of advice or what piece of advice could you give someone who's really looking to do it and just can't get out of their own way? You got to you got to ask yourself why, right? How how bad do you really want it? If you really want it that bad, you're going to you're going to look in you're going to look at yourself whether it's in a mirror, on a piece of paper and say, "Why can't I do this?" And you can list out all the reasons and then you start going through all that stuff. I mean, pick your pick pick your phrase. Poppy, get better, get beat. Maza nothing changes and nothing changes. Eric Champ, right? These are all guys on the team. It's never too late to start, right? Sometimes you could be like, the day sucked. Today was absolutely trash. And it's like nine o'clock at night, you're ready to go to bed. But if you brush your teeth and you go to bed, that's a win, right? Like you don't try to go and do a ton of stuff that you wanted to do that day. You just start where you're at, right? I mean, you've talked about this before on previous podcasts about the the Chinese proverb about planting a tree. When's the best time to plant a tree? 20 years ago and today, right? Plant your tree now. If you're questioning why, reach out to me, reach out to anybody on the 10,000 team. Um, they're awesome dudes. Like every, I can't say enough about how incredibly fortunate and blessed I am to be on this team. Um, but you're not going this alone, right? And it's very easy to feel like you're isolated and like, I have this problem and this issue and all that stuff. We all have problems, we all have issues. That's not to say I don't recognize your problems. I absolutely, like you have, everybody's got things going on that they can't control, but you can control what goes on between your ears. Um, Cause we've all been through thoughts of depression, anxiety, happiness, joy, but you gotta just take one step at a time. Like, how did I do 66 miles in under 10 hours on four different machines? I started and I stopped when it was over, when I crossed the finish line. And I just went one, you know, skier pull, one row, one pedal, one footstep at its time. And I got to where I wanted to go. It, I know it sounds super simple, um, but you really need to break it down and have that patience with yourself to enjoy and take on the process and the journey that you really want to go down that path. I mean, I, I think it's as simple as that, dude. And I think that people really have a hard time just stepping out of the way. So I love that you just sort of broke it down one step, one pedal, one row, one pull. That's it, right? My uncle, he's 70, probably, I think 71 or 72 years old. We had a, you know, I love, I love my uncle, like, like a dad. I mean, he's some, you know, when I was a young kid, I used to say, God, I wish uncle Curtis was my dad. Um, and he's just a, an amazing guy. And, uh, we were on the on, on a call the other night and you know he's going through some stuff and our family is going through some stuff and i said to him i was like unk why don't you just go out and start walking you know just just do it <laughs> and every single day from that day on which was a couple of weeks ago he texts me and says just finish my walk and i'm like blown away by it, man. I'm blown away by it that we had, we can have a conversation and the chances of him, of his life changing because of that conversation are real. You know, yeah. it could, it could be as simple as that. Um, I, I, habits are a big part of my life. I, I would argue to say that habits are the distinction between success and failures in my days uh, on a daily basis. Uh, whether I, I, I nail all, all the things that I like to do or not. Um, and it has a lot to do with my morning routine. Um, the majority of my habits really sort of reside in the morning. Do you have a morning routine and a habit ritual that you can share with us? Yes. And first off, shout out to Uncle Chris. You, I got chills uh, telling that story because that was, that's so cool because he's 70 plus years old and he just started walking, right? He did like essentially the mental mile. Um, and I'll get into that in a second. But yes, I do. I actually started, I created a journal. That, you know, I put it online for everybody to have. It's under a life tactic, right? You can find it on Gumroad. And That's in there, awesome. it, breaks, it breaks down. Because I wanted to be like, all right, I always wanted a planner that kind of, it's not overwhelming. I kind of can just talk about what I want to do throughout the day. And there's habits in there, right? Where it's got the weekly objectives. Just like, what are the two things I want to accomplish during the week? What are the... Um, 
you know, three things I want to accomplish tomorrow because I call this the night before journal. Um, and the biggest habit I have is when I start the day before. It takes five minutes. I fill out the journal. Um, and it outlines everything I want to do in the day. I've tried to do it the morning of. It's not as, it's not as potent. It's not as... Because I'm able to take time. What do I want to achieve tomorrow, this week, this month? And it helps me reaffirm my goals, right? To get into the habits you want to... Your habit is to build something you want in your life to get to something else, right? You, you, it's a building block to build the pyramid, the building, whatever. Um, and then also in here... I have like a debrief, right? What are things I did well? What are things that I did not do so well? And then like, what were the lessons learned? What, and especially the one thing that I like to reflect on at night is like, where did I fail? Because when I reflect on failure before I go to sleep, I don't, I can't sleep any better. Um, I don't need melatonin, any of that stuff. Like when I'm able to recognize my failures during that day, I sleep great. And I am not asleep. Uh, psychologists, I have friends, army scientists that are asleep um, and they, they know their job very well. For me personally, when I reflect and I kind of get that out of, out of me and say, yeah, I failed, but I, I learned something from this. Um, it allows me to find peace and give myself that grace like we talked about. Um, so my habits start the night before, five minutes, I fill out the journal, I go. What that looks like in the morning is I wake up, I go downstairs, I do uh, like water, like tap warm, like room temperature water, pinch of like F or Himalayan salt, splash of lemon juice and cayenne pepper. I drink that, I go close my eyes and sit in quiet for 20 minutes. And I, during meditation, I've, I've done a different bunch of different things. And if I'm going off, please let me know. Um, no, dude, this is awesome. What time do you wake up? Five, right now it's five. Um, it, it's different, you know, during grad school, what, four or five o'clock, depending on when my first class is. Um, so I drink that and I try not to mess around with my phone because it just becomes this black hole. It's very easy to just kind of get sucked in an hour later. Everything you wanted to do is gone. Um, but I've noticed, right, when I started the night before and I wrote down my stuff in the planner, what I wanted to do today, I don't have that desire to go, you know, get a quick, like, as the kids say, right, they're like, tap, get that hit of dopamine. Like, I don't need it. I can just kind of, I'm focused. I know what I want to do because I set those in the night before. Anyway, I go to meditate. Um, I just kind of close my eyes. I've done the apps, Calm, Headspace. That works for people. And it's guided, it's great. But there's something about just being alone in your thoughts with your eyes closed for 20 minutes. And it, I, I had a build to that. Um, it didn't happen off the gate because you'd be opening your eyes every like, you know, 30 seconds. Like, all right, am I ready? Am I done? You know, like you have to give yourself grace. Um, and I never really kind of come to like any like spiritual higher power or anything like that. I'm, you know, Roman Catholic, uh, but I never come to like any spiritual power. But that, for whatever reason, that meditation continues to help out throughout the day, right? Because I've kind of like clear my head of any other noise that's in there. And like ideas or thoughts will come to me and it'll allow me to take action later on in the day. So I meditate, I'll go into the gym for like an hour at the house, um, eat breakfast, shower, shave my face and go about my business. So all in all, right? Like it's essentially what I call uh, my don't fuck with me hour, right? That, that one hour in the morning, I'm waking up before my wife wakes up so I can go do what I need to do to be a better husband, a better, you know, athlete, a better soldier, a better friend, a better, you know, brother, husband, all that stuff. Because I know I need that in order to be ready for whatever else is going to come that day. Because even when the day does go to shit, um, I've had my hour of myself to be where I need to be to handle whatever discomfort, obstacle, barrier gets in my way. It, do I do that every day? Absolutely not. And I'll be the first one to tell you, you know, there's days where I, I do fall into the black, the, you know, the black hole of the phone and I go down like, oh, what happened on Twitter and, you know, the basketball game or the hockey game last night and like, oh my goodness, I can't believe this happened. It's like, that shit doesn't fucking matter. What matters is what I'm doing for other people to help us all get better, right? Because it's going to allow me to get better and go where I want to go. You and I have essentially the exact same morning routine, uh, like almost to a T, which is, which is not surprising to me at all. 
right? I, I was, I kind of almost, I, I, I was going to, I was going to say your morning routine for you. Um, you know, and, and one thing I would share in this, because we have a similar ritual in the morning is my morning is, is a time for me to be selfish. And that said, I'm married and I have kids and I don't sacrifice the time that I could be spending with them to be selfish for myself. I wake up an hour and a half, sometimes two hours earlier than they do so that I could be as selfish as I want. I could do whatever I want. Most of the time, it looks a lot like your morning routine. I wake up, I meditate, I, I have a cup of coffee, I go right into the gym. And by the time I'm done, they're like, you know, having their first bite of breakfast. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and so what I, what I would say to that is anybody who's listening or everybody who's listening, it is okay to put yourself first in your life, but it is not okay to sacrifice time with your family, time at work and put anyone else's life at jeopardy to be selfish because Amen. the win is when we're of service. And the way I am best of service, and I think you would probably share this, is that when I'm well inside, when I feel well, that is when I am capable of being of service to, to my potential. When I'm not well inside, I tend to be thinking about myself way more than when I am well inside. Because if I'm already taken care of, I'm fucking taken care of, man. You know, and I don't have to worry about myself. I'm already taken care of, man. I've already done the hardest shit I'm going to do all day, you know? Um, and now I can just completely be of service and I can be vulnerable and I can allow people to um, give me feedback, right? Like you said, you, you mentioned feedback and, you know, I struggled with that for a while. I just didn't want to hear fucking constructive criticism. I didn't want to hear people tell me I wasn't, I wasn't doing good. Or I needed to right. work on this and that. Now, like you, I'm like, yes, tell me. I want to know how I can be better. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Tony, man, this is an awesome conversation, dude. I, I really appreciate you taking the time with me. Um, I, uh, you know, I was, I, I was reading a book. I forgot the name of the book, but uh, uh, a Marine wrote a book um, that uh, I think it's called Thank You for Your Service. And yeah, it's uh, Matt Best over at Black Rifle Coffee. Oh, is that what it is? It, th it's thank you for my service. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for my service, right? And yeah. you know, he he it, 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 he basically says, you know, like people say thank you for your service because they don't know what else to say when they when they yeah. encounter soldiers um, and military. But I want to say thank you for your service, dude. Um, and, and, I, and, and, and obviously I've had a lot more to say to you than that. Uh, but, but I, um, I'm honestly grateful for what you do and, uh, and for what you've done. And it's incredibly admirable, um, living the life you've led. And, uh, I, I can't wait to check out the feet of strength. It's coming out next week. Yep. Um, yeah. this, this podcast will be out on Wednesday next week. So it's perfect timing. Um, I'd love to get your, I'd love to get people an opportunity to pick up your journal. Um, so yeah. we'll put that in the show notes uh, uh, and in the post, where can we find you? Anywhere. Uh, well, not every, uh, li LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, Instagram, the Tony Nash, you, you can find me. Got your six podcast. It's got your, and then the number six pod, uh, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, reach out. It's me. You're talking to, to me. There's, there's no team. It's just old T Nash T bone. Uh, that's going to respond to you on the other end. Happy to hear from everybody. Uh, tell me that this episode sucked. Uh, I'd, I'd love to hear it. Or if it helped you, you know, let me know. Um, because I'm just, thank you for letting me, you know, chat with you. This has been something I've wanted to do for a while to get to hear more about your story, right? You, you sharing about being a father helping out Uncle Curtis, the family, and the struggles that you constantly battle every day. Uh, because I, my admiration is equal, right? Real recognizes real. So thank you, my man. Tony, I always finish the podcast with the same question. Do you think you were born or was Tony Nash made over time? 100% made. Just like the MTV show.
a little bit more than 30 days. Copy that, Roger. Roger that. Copy that. Um, you're a mater. I didn't know. I, you know, I was trying to figure out what you were going to say. Um, I was torn. Uh, but I, I, I see, I see where your, where your head's at on that. And, and I appreciate it. And, and your confidence level there makes me believe that it's true. Uh, so anyone out there that uh, thinks that there's something you know, outside of themselves that's stopping them from reaching their goals. Tony Nash just told you that he is a made man. He was not born with some, you know, supernatural uh, ability to do what he does. Uh, he's not unique. I'm not unique. You can, let me repeat that loud and clear. You can do whatever it is you actually want to do. All you have to do is do. And I'm going to finish there, Tony. You're the fucking man. Thank you so much for joining us, brother. Reach out Thanks to Tony Nash. He's the fucking kindest guy on the planet. Thank you, brother. Thanks, Thanks for inspiring us, man.